This is Salem Heights Today. Our upcoming praise and prayer is this Tuesday, January 16th at 7 p.m. in the chapel. Join us for a time of worship and prayer all together as a church family. All ministries, except for the most excellent way, will be on pause this week. High schoolers, you're invited to winter retreat February 2nd through the 4th at Trout Creek Bible Camp. Come enjoy a time of fellowship, worship, and lots of fun. Be sure to register on the website today. The construction team has been hard at work the last several weeks. They have demoed and framed offices in what was previously room 200 and are making progress on the new balcony in the auditorium. We are excited to share more updates as they continue to make more progress. Have a great week. Well, good morning, church. I hope that you are safe and warm this morning as you watch this service. And although we're not able to gather together this morning, we have prepared a message as we continue our series, The Unseen Hand. And so I invite you to grab your Bibles, find a comfy spot to watch this service, and join us as we now worship our Savior together.
says, I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. So may my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. And I love you, Lord. And though your mercy never fails me, and all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will see the goodness of God In all my life you have been faithful God. I love your voice that you have led me to the fire. We've been there right in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. Yes, I've known you as a friend. And I
tell him like it's a prayer. And all my life you have been so, you're so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Well, good morning again, church, and I'm really excited to be with you this morning as we continue our series, The Unseen Hand. And We've had kind of an overarching theme for this series, and that is this, that in every generation, God's unseen hand is working all things together for our good and His glory. And you might be wondering, why this series and why now? Well, we're in the midst of a construction project here at the church. We've been uh, relocated out to Corbin University and to home groups for a season uh, as we are completing some construction that's going to allow us to expand space and have more people join us as we grow as a church. But it's in those times when there's still some uncertainty in regards to timelines and costs and how it's all going to look that uh, we might be tempted to question God, question his timing, question his vision, and question his provision. And so we wanted to take our church back uh, through a number of stories in the Bible where God's unseen hand is evident. And even though we might not be able to perceive it in the moment, we can look back with confidence and see that God was already going before us and working things together for our good in his glory. And so this morning, I want us to look at that familiar story in the book of Exodus of Moses. We're not going to look at the whole thing, but for most of us, we've heard of the story of Moses if we've grown up. Perhaps we saw uh, the movie Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston back in the day, or some of the cartoon renditions of this story about this Hebrew baby who was raised in Pharaoh's household, but then becomes the leader of the people of Israel and leads them out of captivity in Egypt. In the first chapter of Exodus, we see that the people of Israel have ended up in Egypt because during a famine, Jacob took him, himself and his sons and his descendants to Egypt and was able to get food, able to get provision. And there's a whole story that we read at the end of Genesis about how God used one of Jacob's sons, Joseph, through some mischief of his brothers to put him in a position to be able to provide for the people of Israel when that famine came. Well, the people stayed there long after Jacob died. And they began to grow and grow and grow, so much so that the Egyptian pharaoh or their king became really nervous about this growing population within his country. And so he began to oppress them. But that oppression only made them grow faster. The people of Israel continued to multiply. And so he actually came up with an edict that to try to control the growth of the nation of Israel, the pharaoh ordered that all baby boys be murdered. Well, the Hebrew midwives were the ones that would help Uh, deliver babies, they were told that if a baby was born and it was a boy, they were to kill that baby. It says in in chapter 1 of Exodus, they actually feared God more than Pharaoh, and they did not obey him. And so through that, we read of the story in chapter 1 and into chapter 2 of the story of Moses, how he was born into this family, and his parents hid him. And then eventually, when it became difficult to hide this baby boy, put him in a basket, put him into the river, and he's discovered by Pharaoh's daughter and is adopted into Pharaoh's family and is raised in that household. We're going to pick up the story today at the end of chapter 2 in Exodus. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to join me in Exodus chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 23 and we're going to read through verse 10 of chapter 3. It says this, After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned because of their difficult labor. They cried out, and their cry for help because of the difficult labor ascended to God. God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the Israelites, and God knew. Meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. As Moses looked, he saw that the bush was on fire, but was not consumed. So Moses thought, I must go over and look at this remarkable sight. Why isn't the bush burning up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, he answered. Do not come closer, he said. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. 
Then he continued, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I've observed the misery of my people in Egypt and have heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I know about their sufferings and I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from, a land, from that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the, ter- the territory of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. So because of the Israelites' cry for help has come to me, And I have also seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now, this is a story that, like I said, many of us are familiar with. But there are three things that I want us to to see, be reminded of from this story of Moses that kind of reflect God's unseen hand. And the first one is this. God's present provisions were prepared in the past. Here we have the people of Israel. They had been oppressed by the Egyptian pharaoh. They had been become made slaves and they they made their workload very demanding and they were very harsh with the Israelite people and they, they groaned and they cried out to God because they were being treated harshly and wrongly. And even though that didn't stop them from growing and then the pharaoh adds on top of that harsh treatment this order to kill the babies, it says that God heard their cries. God saw their suffering. He knew what they needed. What I see here is that God protected Moses, that in this time now where we pick up the story at the end of chapter two, the people are crying out. There's now a new Pharaoh in power and he's pouring it on to them. They're suffering and they are just so discouraged and they're crying out to God. It says God saw them, but the provision of Moses that God is going to send to, to lead them out of Egypt, God had already been protecting and preparing in the past. God moved in the lives of those Hebrew midwives to not follow through on Pharaoh's order. God led Moses' parents to come up with a way to have him be hidden. God leads the Pharaoh's daughter to not only find Moses, but to adopt him and to raise him up and to educate him and to provide for him. And now God's going to call Moses and say, God, I've, I've prepared you, I've equipped you, I've identified you, Moses, for a specific role. God protected Moses. He provided for Moses, and he prepared Moses for this moment. God's present provisions were prepared in the past. You know, for you and I, there's, there, we have needs right now. There's all kinds of needs all around us, and we need God's help. We need his provision. We need him to intervene and do things that we can't do and to provide for us in ways that we can't provide for ourselves. And what we see all throughout Scripture is that God's not surprised by our current moment. God's not caught off guard, and He's not looking in His pockets and pulling out empty pockets and going, I don't have anything for you. He is always working ahead. He's always planning ahead. He knows exactly what we're going to need. And when it comes to that time, it comes to that moment, He provides it. I'm reminded when I was growing up, our family every summer went camping. That was kind of what we did. It was a a cheap vacation. We would go for a couple of weeks up into the Sierra Nevada mountains outside of Sacramento, and we would go to the same spot, and we'd camp. And as a little kid, it was amazing. We would swim. We would bike. We'd do campfires. We'd go on hikes. We'd just play. And I have a lot of terrific memories from those years of camping. But one of the most dreadful things of camping every summer was having to help my parents pack the car. It felt like it just took forever. It's like we were just excited to go. When are we going to get in the car? And it was just hours and hours, well, at least what it felt like as a kid, of my mom and my dad packing things, going to the store, preparing things, and we had to load it all into the car. And it was kind of like that game of Tetris where we had to make sure it all fit to get it all in there with my siblings. But here's what I can tell you. As, as hard as that was, and even though I didn't appreciate what was going on, My mom and my dad were preparing for what was to come. They knew what to anticipate. They saw what we were going to need, being away from home for a couple of weeks. And when we'd get in there and we would need a supply, hey, do we have any fresh towels? Or hey, do we still have stuff to make s'mores? There they were, they were able to go into that box or go into that bag and say, yeah, we have it. It's ready. I'm so thankful for the careful planning of my parents as they prepared for those camping trips. And what we see in scripture is that God is our provider. 
God has been already cultivating provision for us in the past that we weren't even aware of. And then when it comes to that moment when we cry out to God and say, God, we need your help, he says, I have just what you need. I've been preparing it. And that's what he's been doing in Moses' life. He's protected Moses. He's provided for Moses. And now he's prepared Moses for this moment. I think this is such an important truth for our church to hear and understand that even though we're in a time right now that's exciting and yet uncertain, God is certain. And his unseen hand is going to go ahead and continue to guide and move forward his plan and his will as he has prepared. And he's been working on that plan and bringing that stuff to pass even when we haven't noticed it. That's one of the things I'm reminded about when I read about God's provision here in the book of Exodus. But there's a second thing, and that is God is presently preparing provision for our future. Right now, God is preparing things that we're going to need in the future. He was preparing things in the past that we need right now, and right now he's preparing things that we're going to need in the future. Probably the the part of this this text from this morning that stands out to me the most is verses 23 through 25 and the end of chapter 2. It says, After a long time the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned because of their difficult labor. They cried out and their cry for help because of the difficult labor ascended to God. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the Israelites and God knew. I love those four statements is that they're calling out to God. They're saying, God, do you see? God, do you understand what's going on right now? I need help. And it said that God heard them. He remembered what he had committed to do for them. He saw them. He saw their their circumstances. He saw their suffering and he knew the depths of it. And then I love what it goes on to say there, in verse 3, in, in my translation, it says, Meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. It's like, as all that's going on, and these people that are in Egypt are crying out to God, and they are suffering at the exact same time. That's what I think of when I think of that word meanwhile. At the exact same time, God is preparing Moses. He's interacting with Moses. He's, he's about to call Moses and say, Moses, I'm sending you to be the answer to the prayers of my people in Egypt. God right now is preparing provisions that we're going to need as a church in the future. He's doing it right now. Even right now, as we are relocating and we're building and we're displaced and there's all kinds of things that we're having to be flexible for and adapt to, we can look back even right now. I have stories I could share with you if we had the time of how God has already gone before us and put people in places and relationships in places and resources in places that are available right now when we need them. And he was already doing that in the past. And right now, I believe, based on what scripture says and what we see here in the story, that right now God is doing things that we might not even perceive that are going to meet the needs we have in the future. But not only is it God going to provide provision and, and, and gather resources and provide things for us for the future outside of us, right now I believe God's also doing a work in us. He's preparing us for this next stage of life, this next season of life as a church. And sometimes when we go into situations that are uncertain and they're difficult, we almost kind of wrestle like, Lord, how do we just get back to what's normal? How do we get back to the status quo? How do we get back to what's comfortable? And what God is actually saying is, I'm going to actually let you struggle a little bit. I'm going to let you kind of feel that discomfort because what it's going to do is it's going to drive you towards me and, and, and drive you to ask me for help rather than rely on yourself. And I'm going to be able to show you something. I'm going to do something through the, that you would never be able to see or experience if you were trying to do it on your own. I was reading in a book recently uh, a story from a pastor that was kind of talking about the physical exertion that a moth has to, to use to get out of its cocoon. He tells the story that there was a, a man who, was, who saw this cocoon. He could almost see this, this moth wrestling inside. And in a desire to be kind of sympathetic to that moth, he, he actually cuts the cocoon to let that moth out, to try to relieve it of its struggle. But what that person did not understand was that moth needs that struggle. It says there, The struggle to emerge from the cocoon was an essential part of developing the muscle system of that moth's body and pushing the body fluids out into the wings to them to expand. By wisely seeking to cut short the moth's struggle, the watcher had actually crippled the moth and doomed its existence. 
The author goes on to say, such is the case with the muscle of our faith. If we habitually seek to escape from all the painful trials rather than joyfully submit to them as God, as part of the endurance building program he's putting us through, we may forego opportunities to have our faith muscles exercised and strengthened. There is something that God is doing right now. He's He's preparing in us, not just preparing for us. He's preparing something in us as a church, as the individuals of the church, and as us collectively, as a church family. He's doing something in us right now that is uncomfortable, it's uncertain, it's causing us to, to learn new rhythms and to explore new ways of doing things. And as uncomfortable as that is, we actually need to endure that. We need to wrestle through that, fixing our eyes on Jesus turning to him because what God is doing right now is not just letting us dangle and suffer and trying to make things hard for us. God is not trying to be inconvenient. I believe God is allowing us to go through something that's both exciting and challenging because he's preparing us for what's next. He's preparing you for what he wants you to learn, what he wants you to do. He's preparing you right now for that. And so instead of us trying to open the cocoon and get out of the struggle as quick as possible. I think we need to lean into this and say, Lord, we're thankful for your provision right now, but we know you're doing something right now that's going to be a provision for us in the future. Will you help us stay faithful to you? Will you help us keep our eyes fixed on you? This is just another example that we see here in the scriptures that while they were calling out to God in Egypt, God was at that very moment hearing their prayers and, because he's God, talking to Moses and calling him and drawing him to come have a conversation with him through a burning bush. It's an amazing thing. But there's one more thing that kind of highlights God's unseen hand in this story, and that is this, is that God perceives our pain and responds to our prayer. See, I don't think it's wrong for us to feel the struggle, to feel the discomfort of being in a season like we are. But one of the things that we learn from this story is that God is keenly aware of our needs. He perceives them. It uses words like he sees and he hears. He knows about our suffering. That's what he says about them. It goes on here in Exodus chapter 3 where Moses is hearing the Lord say this, that I've observed the misery of my people in Egypt. So he's, I've seen them. He goes on to say, I've heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I know about their sufferings. He's telling Moses, Moses, I am uniquely, intimately, personally aware of what my people are going through, the people that I love, the people that I've that I've called, I've drawn them out for myself. I see them. I know what's going on. God perceives our struggles and he hears our prayers. And he responds to those. How does he respond here in this story? Well, first he he responds by calling Moses out. He says, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh to lead my people out of the Israel, out of Egypt. But I love what we see just before that in verse 8. It says this, and I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from a land uh, to a, a land that is good and spacious, a land flowing with milk and honey. But what the Lord says through this burning bush to Moses is that I've seen my people and I am coming to rescue them. It would be God's power at work through Moses that God would use to deliver his people out of Egypt because he was perceptive of their pain and he respond, responded to their prayers. You know, as I think about this story of Moses and I, reading through chapters 1 and 2 and into 3, thinking about the story of God's plan and how he protected Moses and prepared Moses and then sends Moses and provides through Moses it's pretty obvious that there's a connection and there's a lot of similarities that we see between the life of Moses and the life of Jesus. Moses is actually a great picture of an even greater deliverer to come who would be Jesus. If you look at both of their stories, there was a fear. The fear in Moses' story is the, the fear of the Pharaoh had over Israel growing. In the story of Jesus that we read in the Gospels, we see that King Herod had the fear of this new king, a new Messiah being born. And then we see a plot hatched. In, in Moses' story, the plot was to kill all the baby boys. And that's the exact same plot that we see in the first couple of chapters of the Gospels that tell the story of Jesus' birth, that King Herod had actually ordered a decree to kill all the babies. 
Then we see a similar response. In, in Moses' story, the midwife's response to that order was to resist and to protect the boys. In Jesus' story, the magi, those, those wise men seeking to go find where Jesus was at, they were told to tell Herod, but they resisted that, having been instructed by the Lord that Herod actually wanted to harm Jesus. They resist and protect Jesus. We see escape in both of their stories. Where Moses escapes to Egypt, Jesus' family escapes to Egypt. And then the return. Moses returns to Egypt to free people from there. And in our story, Jesus returns to Israel to free people from sins. Moses was a picture of an even greater deliverer to come in Jesus. Just like the people of Egypt, I think God sees our misery and he knows about our suffering. When we cry out to God and we say, God, we need you. We need your help. We need your wisdom. We need your direction. We need you to intervene. The Bible tells us that God sees us. He hears our cries. He's close to those who are brokenhearted. He comforts those who are in affliction. And what does he do? He sends his son to rescue us. As we conclude our message for this morning and we just consider the the works of the unseen hand in this story of Moses, I'm pretty sure that if you and I took a moment to think about it, there are probably instances where we've already had a moment where we've seen God come to the rescue, where God has stepped into our life, or perhaps when God has used a struggle to develop our faith or deepen our experience of his presence and his provision in our life. Sometimes we get so focused on our current struggle, we forget about all that God has done. But we're called to remember because by remembering what God has done, it gives us faith for the current struggle that we might be experiencing. So whether you, this morning, are currently facing something that is difficult, you've been enduring a trial for a while, or perhaps there's something in your life that you really need God to to show up and help with. You need God to help you sense His presence or to Remember his promises. I want you to remember, God sees, he hears, he knows, and he provides. That's the God of the unseen hand. That's the God that is at work at this story here in Exodus, and I believe that's the same God that's at work both in us individually and also at work in us at Salem Heights Church. Would you pray with me? Father God, I just thank you so much for this opportunity to reflect on a really familiar story out of the Old Testament where we are reminded that you are a God that goes before us, that you are providing right now today for our needs with provisions you've already put into motion in the past. And you are right now providing and and, and generating and, and working on creating provision that you will show us in the future because you are a good and gracious God. And so God, I pray that we remember about your past goodness, your present goodness, and the future goodness that you promised to us, and that that would cause us in in moments of struggle or moments of trial, God, that you would cause us to pray to you, to know that you see what we need, and to ask for your help and know that you respond to the prayers of your people. God, thank you for being our deliverer. Thank you for being our king. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.